online, on Facebook and on YouTube. And then a warm welcome this morning to all our Palm 96.7 FM listeners. So glad you decided to join us this morning. And then welcome to all the hundreds of people here in the building this morning. Amen. So good to see you all. And uh, we trust that the Word of God, wherever you are this morning, is going to touch you. It is going to change you. And it's going to manifest in your life in a fresh and a new way. Amen. Are we ready for the Word? Amen. And this is a big thanks for all the volunteers serving here this morning. Thank you so much for your commitment, for your service. And uh, come on, you can give yourselves a great big round of applause. We appreciate you. We love you. This church cannot exist without its volunteers. So we give you honor this morning and we thank you for your service this morning. Amen. Are we ready for the Word? I want us to stay on the subject of having faith in God this morning, as I truly believe that this is a vital aspect of your faith, and it's something that many people fail to fully grasp. What does it mean to have faith in God? And so last week I shared on how Jesus taught His disciples a lesson in faith, and He told them to have faith in God, meaning they were to make God the object of their faith and not the thing that they wanted God to do. And so it's important for you to understand from the onset that your faith works because you have faith in God, not because you have faith in the thing that you want God to do. Amen? And so the object of our faith has to be God. We have to set our gaze and our attention, and we have to put our faith in God. And so this morning I want to come from a different angle. I'm not busy with a series. I'm a little bit like a boxer this morning, seeing what is going to be the knockout blow for you this morning. And so last week I maybe came with a bit of a left hook. And so this week maybe I'm going to come with an uppercut, see what's going to hit you in the gut. And it's going to open up your eyes to the possibilities that are open to you when you have faith in God. And so just to be clear for those who might find this confusing these messages in that it seems I'm advocating a life that we leave everything up to God and just sit back and watch Him do miracles. This is not a sermon about that. Amen? So you have to put that out of your mind. There's a lot of sermons. There are thousands and thousands of sermons that I've, I've even preached a lot of them as well with five points to blessing and three steps to overcoming and seven steps to favor. There's a lot of those messages out there. And sometimes we apply our faith like a bunch of steps. That if I do this, then God will do this. And if I do that, then God must do that. And so this is not a sermon about that. Amen. I want you to prepare your hearts and your minds and to set your focus on the ability that God has to act in your life. To set your gaze and the object of your faith on God this morning. And so as I said last week, the Bible says we've all been given a measure of faith. And that faith is a divine persuasion. It's the persuasion and the ability of God working in us to do what God has called us to do. And so that is the persuasion that God has in us that allows us to live life by faith and to do works of faith. That means that we've been given faith to do according to what the Word says we are to do, in that we please God, who the Bible says is pleased by our faith. And so we believe as Christians, if we live by faith according to the Word of God, that God then will do what we're unable to do. God will provide what we're unable to produce and God will give what we are unable to gain. And so God has given you a measure of faith so that you can respond to Him in faith. And so your faith life really is a response to God. Amen. Because God's given you a measure of faith so that you can respond to Him in faith because faith is the only thing that pleases Him. And so the more you live by faith, the more you learn to have faith in God. And the more you believe that God is able in your life. 
Our scripture verse this morning is from Ephesians 3, verse 20 and 21. It says, Now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly more than all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, or dreams, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. If I was you, I would take that scripture and put it up on a wall somewhere. To remind yourself every day that God is able. And so the title of my message this morning is God is able. God is able. And so this has nothing to do with you right now. This is everything to do with God's ability and what you believe He can or cannot do in your life. And so I want to lay a bit of a foundation going back to your salvation for you to understand how this life of faith works because a lot of Christians talk about faith. But I see more and more that Christians don't really understand how to live by faith. What does that look like for a Christian? And so in Ephesians 3, we see the mystery of God revealed for the salvation of the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. And up until Jesus, salvation was only for the Jews. And there was nothing the Gentiles could do to receive salvation. And so this was the mystery that God revealed to Paul when he knocked him off the horse. He revealed to him this mystery of salvation, which would now be accessible to the Gentiles. And so he says in Ephesians 3 verse 6, This mystery is that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. And so the promise of salvation was now to the Gentiles as well, meaning that every blessing and every promise that belonged to the Jews through Abraham, belonged now to the Gentiles when they believed in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When they received Him by faith. And so Ephesians 3 verse 12, it says, Because of Christ and our faith in Him. Highlight that in our, your Bible. Because of Christ and our faith in Him. We can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. The salvation is received because of our faith in Christ. Salvation cannot be earned by good works. It cannot be earned through moral standing or proclaiming or professing to be a good person. It is not something that you can earn or that you can work for. It is something that you receive because you have faith in Jesus. And so this should be a clue to you from the day that you got born again, is that nothing that you did got you saved. Maybe somebody invited you to church, you heard the gospel message, you probably didn't even praise and worship, you most likely didn't lift your hands, you probably were distracted by all kinds of things, but when you looked again, you responded to the gospel message, and you gave your life to Jesus, and you did nothing for it. You just responded. Amen? Stay with me. And so you are only saved through faith in Jesus Christ. No other way. And so once I'm saved, everything I do now by faith is in response to God. Because of my salvation, I don't serve, I don't give, I don't worship, I don't reach out to people because of what I can get. I do it because of what I already got. And this is a big theme that you need to understand about faith, is that I don't serve, I don't preach, I don't give. I don't reach out to people because of something I can get. I do it because of something I already got. It's a response to God. It is my faith response.
character. We see the nature of God. And so in Ephesians 3, God is trying to say to us and get our attention about who He is and our response to Him. And so when we look at Ephesians 3.20, firstly Paul tells us that God is able. God is able. God is able. God is able. You have to believe this. That word able in the Greek means to have power or to be powerful. That's a big word, the word able. But if we break it down for our own understanding, it says to us that God is powerful. That God has the power to do in our lives what we believe for Him to do. And so whatever Paul is about to say after this statement, he is making it clear that God has the ability to do what he is about to tell us. Some of you need to get this revelation. So Paul is telling us, listen, before I go any further, I want you to know that this God who we serve, he is able. He is powerful. He is capable. He has the power to do in your life what you need Him to do. And so before He goes further, He lets us know, the reader, that our God is able. And I want us to pause there for a minute because many of us in the season of whatever you want to call it, of the pandemic, of the lockdown, of the shutdown, of the crunch down, all the downs that the world's trying to get us down in on, but because of the season that we find ourselves in, many of us have stopped believing that God is able. And we are limit, living limited Christian lives because of it. We've stopped believing that God can come through for us. We've stopped believing that God can help us. We've stopped believing that God can heal us. We've stopped believing that God can deliver us. And that's why so many Christians are running around trying to sort out their lives, trying to gain what they have lost, when God is able to do it. If you would believe. He is able. God is able. I want you to take a moment. And think right now, in your life, think of a situation, because all of us have situations that are staring us in the face, things we may be hoping for, things we need a breakthrough in, things we need to be delivered from, things that we need to be healed of. All of us have that something. Now, I want to ask you the question, while you're thinking of this thing, do you believe that God can sort that thing out? Do you believe that God can heal you? Do you believe that God can deliver you? Do you believe that God can give you favor in that situation? Do you believe that God can give you breakthrough in that situation? I want you to be honest with yourself. Do you really believe it? God is able. God is infinitely more powerful and more capable of doing the miraculous in your life than what you believe. I'm going to say it again. God is infinitely more powerful and more capable of doing the miraculous in your life than what you believe. So what is God trying to say to us? Plain English, He's trying to say this. He can do it. You just need to believe it. He 
You see, your faith is a response. Your faith is a response. Your faith is a response to a God who you believe is able to do in your life what only He can. Still on Ephesians 3.20, it says, Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Excuse me. It's a big passage of Scripture, this. And so the words exceedingly and abundantly are taken from the same Greek word where we get the word hyper from. Do you know the word hyper? We all remember Hyperama, the big shop that has everything. Now that word exceedingly and abundantly is where we get the word hyper from, which means excessive, which means over, which means above, which means beyond, which means more than. And so those two words come from the same root word, but Paul was trying to get the message through that using the word exceedingly wasn't enough, so he put the word abundantly there as well, and after that he put the word above. To get our attention to the infinite possibilities and abilities of our God that He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above. That's God. He's not a get-by God. He's not a I'll see God. He's a God of exceedingly, abundantly, above. God is the source of all life. And what Paul is trying to convey is that God is an infinite source. To every need we might ever have, and He has the answer to every question you might ask. God is infinite. God is limitless. You cannot out-ask God. You cannot bankrupt God. God has exceedingly, abundantly, above what you could even imagine. But do you believe it? Do you believe that He is able in your life? God has no shortage of supply. God has no limitation. And He can give us far more than we could possibly ask or think. I'm trying to drive this through to you this morning. Because it's not about what you have. It's about who God is. You have to believe that He is able, that He can do that thing in your life. You have to believe it. Some of you are wrestling with so many things, and you've stopped believing. And when we stop believing, we enter into dangerous territory, because now we start wanting to manipulate things to happen for us. And not allow God to do it in our life. That's how people end up in the wrong place. That's sadly how people lose themselves, because they lose sight of God. And so if you're going to go anywhere by faith, you need to start here. God is able. Write that down somewhere. Make it a tattoo or something. God is able. Please, if you're a youth or a student, don't go get a tattoo now. Say the pastor said. Amen. You have to rid yourself, your mind and your thoughts, of any beliefs or any doubts regarding God's ability to do things in your life. 
You're going to have to unlearn some things. Because as we go through the process of life, we go through disappointment, we go through loss, we go through hurt, we go through pain. And now we equate those things that we experience to a God who didn't come through for us. Here's a new flash. Life happens. You're going to get hurt. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to lose out. But my Bible says, after every loss, I'm able to get back up and go again. I'm able to overcome. Don't let your setbacks hold you back from everything that God's got for you. You just have to start believing that God is able again. Here's another scripture. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. It says it so well. It says, and God is able, there's that word again, God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come in abundance to you so that you may always, under all circumstances, regardless of need, have complete sufficiency in everything, being completely self-sufficient in Him and have an abundance of ev for every good work and act of charity. Another scripture you can print out and put on a wall somewhere. God is able. And He is able to get things to you and to bless you with certain things and to have favor on you for the things that you need because He has the ability to do it. You just need to believe it. It's big words being thrown around in the scripture. Abundance. Sufficiency. Blessing and favor. That's what you have in God. Don't measure your experiences in life and say that this is God. It's not. I preached a sermon some time ago on the trials that we experience in life and the purpose they serve. Every trial you experience sometimes a test that God, has, God allows, but every trial strengthens you. Don't say because you are going through a trial that God doesn't love you and that God doesn't care. We all go through trials. The key is to keep on believing that God is able. Amen. All throughout Scripture, God is telling us that He has the power, He has the ability, and He has the resources. If God has the power and the ability to bless us beyond measure with peace and mercy and grace and favor and hope and love and provision, why is it that so many of us lack for many of these things that I'm speaking about? Do you believe that peace can be restored in your home? Do you believe that hope can be restored in your life? Do you believe that God can open up doors of favor for you? Do you believe that God can provide in your need? Because I'm not just talking about physical, earthly needs. I'm also talking about spiritual, emotional needs as well. Some of you have no peace in your life. You're angry all the time. You're frustrated all the time. You're miserable all the time. And that's not a good adver advertisement for Christianity. And God can bring you peace. God can restore hope in your life. God can restore love in your heart. God can bring mercy and grace in abundance into your life. We always just measure it about these earthly things and money and possessions, but you know that Jesus said, I've come to give you peace. One of the greatest blessings in this life is peace in your heart, peace in your home, peace in your marriage, peace in your life, peace in your company, peace in your business. 
if you're fighting everybody all the time, why not believe God for peace? For grace and mercy to come upon you. For the love of God to overwhelm you. God has an abundance of these things that He can bring into your life. And so why is it then that as Christians we lack for these things? Well, I believe the answer lies in the final part of Ephesians 3.20, which says, according to the power that works in us. According to the power that works in you. What am I saying? The word according in Greek is a very big word. I'm not going to go into it. When I studied it, there was like pages and pages and pages behind this word's meaning. But in the context of this scripture, it is known in English as a preposition. It's used before a noun and it shows direction or location. Now, this is not an English lesson, please. I'm just trying to tell you what the word is and how it's used. So it's a preposition used before a noun that indicates location or direction. Amen. Am I right there, Kirsty? Okay. But in this instance, that word means in proportion to or the one that I like, the measure to. And so when we read Ephesians 3.20 again, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think in proportion to or to the measure to the power that works in us. Now why is that so important, Pastor? Because Ephesians 3.20 tells us that God is able, He is powerful, He is capable, and He is without limit. Amen. That's what it says in the beginning. But it continues to say that we will see God's ability, His power, and His provision only in proportion to what we allow, believe, or have faith in Him for. And so the power of God works in your life only to the level that you believe it can. It's not because God doesn't want to work in your life. It's because you allow Him to work to a certain limit. Because that's what that word according means. In proportion to your faith. To the measure that you allow God to work in your life. Amen. And so when you read that scripture, because as Christians, I've thrown it around and sent it as encouragement to people. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond what we can ask or think. But we stop there. It continues to say, according to, in proportion to, to the measure that you allow. The measure to which God works in your life is only to the measure to which you allow Him to, invite Him to, or ask Him to. That's why we sometimes don't have a problem trusting God for healing. Because we allow Him to come into our lives in that area and we have faith for healing. But then we struggle to trust God with our finances. And so you have faith for God for certain things and other things you struggle with. And this I know is a faith journey because I didn't have it all together when I first got born again. And I still don't have it all together as I'm preaching to you this morning. Because this sermon was a lesson to me as well. But if you believe God for the one thing, why don't you believe Him for everything? Because He's able to do in that thing that He's done in this thing. But it's according to what you believe. It's according to the measure that you allow Him to work in your life in that area. 
And I never want you to look at Ephesians 3.20 the same way again. Because there is the God part that says God is infinitely powerful and able. But then it says according to. And we've always thought that it's according to God's power working in us. And to a degree it's right. But it actually means according to the power that we allow to work in us. God has no favorites in this world. God doesn't like or bless one Christian more than another Christian. The only reason some Christians see God move in their lives is because they dare to believe God more than others. Never get jealous at a Christian that sees breakthrough, that sees healing, that sees deliverance, that sees favor. Because God doesn't have favorites in His kingdom. Because those people dare to believe God for the full measure of what He can do. Why not believe for the full measure of God? Why not? Because my Bible says, my God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond. That means that God won't only heal your heart disease, He'll give you a heart that was stronger than before because He does it exceedingly abundantly. With me? If you're trusting God for a million rand deal, God is able to give you a 10 million rand deal. Never put a limitation on God because you're being humble. God does exceedingly, abundantly. You just need to take a walk through nature sometime and look at God's creation in all its glory. God wasn't holding back. That's why nature, and we go to some places sometimes, it takes our breath away. Because it speaks to us of God's limitless nature and what He's able to do. I don't care what your condition or situation is. I'm not saying this because I don't care about you. But if my Bible tells me that God is able, then I'm going to believe that He is able to do it for me. Amen? If it hasn't happened yet, if I haven't seen my breakthrough, if I haven't received my healing, my deliverance, or my provision, then I'm going to start believing God even more until I see it. Because things in your life might change, but God doesn't. He's still a provider. He's still a healer. He's still a deliverer. He's still a savior. God is still able. Don't measure Him against your life experience because you will miss Him. You'll miss your moment of visitation. This is what you need to know. And this is maybe what's happening in your life. Satan is a discourager. He doesn't always have to scare you or threaten you to get you out of the will of God. It's not always a demon manifestation and a scary situation. He takes his time to wear you down, to frustrate you, to lie to you because he's the father of lies. He's the accuser of the brethren. He takes his time to exhaust you and to discourage you. That's what he does. That's what most of his ministry is. An accuser of the brethren. A discourager of the saints. And he wears you down to the point where you don't believe anymore. You're saved, but you're living hell on earth. And that's not what you're called to. The fact that you feel a certain way about something and your life doesn't change who God is. He is still able. And you need to wake up from your situation. And if you allow it to continue another 18 months, where are you going to end up? 
I know all of us have been through a very hard time. This last 16, 17 months hasn't been easy. Hasn't been easy leading a church in these times. I'll be honest. But I have to keep believing that God is able. That even if the government does shut us down, that we'll see this building filled. That we'll see souls saved. That we'll see families come and that we'll see youth come and we'll see students come and we'll see young people come. I have to continue believing it and not looking to the circumstances. I don't care what our president's going to say tonight if he does speak. Because I know my God is able. And guess what? This church is far from a glorious church, and God's returning for a glorious church. And so I'll keep building, and I'll keep pushing, and I'll keep believing till I see the glory of God manifest in this place. Don't stop. I almost sang a song to you now. Don't stop believing. Maybe you should put that journey song on. Amen? Don't stop believing. God is able. You have to believe that God can do it. You know, I'll be honest, I was even battling putting this message together in the way that the Spirit was leading me. Because guess what I wanted to do? I wanted to give you three points to that and five points to that and seven points to this. And every time the Holy Spirit brings me back, no, God is able. No, God is able. No, Mark, it's not about you. It's about your faith in God. And then everything that you do in this life is a response to God. And that's where works of faith come from. You don't do works of faith to get God's attention. Works of faith comes because God has your attention. We do it in response to a God who is able. This has nothing to do with your Christian performance. Because I have seen many Christians who perform very well, fall from grace and backslide and lose themselves. And it's sad. And when you would look at them, they'd be busy bees involved in everything and doing everything, and they'd be the model Christian. But it wasn't rooted in a relationship with God that had faith in God. It was all performance. And God's not after your performance. He's after your faith. Your number one priority as a Christian is your relationship with God and that you keep on believing that He is good, that He is for you, and that He loves you. Everything flows from that relationship and the closer you get to God, the more you believe the more you have faith for Him. Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. The one who seeks, finds. And to to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. You have to be relentless in your pursuit and your faith in God. There He tells us to seek, to knock, to ask. Don't stop because of your situation. We have to become like little children again in our faith. God is not calling us to be childish. He's calling us to be childlike. And there's a difference because a lot of Christians have become childish in their faith, throwing little tantrums and having a little attitude with God. And that's fine. God can deal with your attitude, but God's not called you to be childish. He's called you to be childlike. Have you ever noticed how children have the ability to wear you down? Amen. (laughs) Amen, Andre. You know, I've noticed with Levi, I might be trying to enjoy... Sport on the TV. And then Levi gets it into his mind that it's now time to build blocks. To build the highest tower that he can. 
And then he would come to me. He sees that I'm busy watching TV, watching sport, but he would wear me down. Papa, 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 Papa. I would sometimes sit and think, maybe he's going to stop, but he doesn't stop. And then he comes real serious, and then he takes my hand, and he says, Papa, thank you for like I need help. And then he pulls me up. But he doesn't stop until I move from that chair and respond to his request. And so in his mind as a child, he believes that his father has the ability to do whatever he asks his father to do. There's not one ounce of doubt in Levi's mind that I am not able to do something for him. If he wants to do something that's hard, he asks me to do it. And then I do it. He's never come to me ever in doubt of my ability to do it. That's what childlike faith is. And so, we bought him a big trampoline for his birthday a few months ago. Now, as a 45-year-old, my ability to jump on a trampoline is not what it was when I was 20 years old. But he's got all these tricks that he wants me to do, fall on my stomach and fall on my backside and fall on my knees. And after 20 minutes of that, I promise you, not all things feel like they should. But he believes that his dad can do it. And so he never stops asking. And so yesterday, we were on the trampoline again. And he wears me down. But he believes that I can do it with him. And as he sees me move, he takes more risks. You have to be like a child with God. And believe that he can. have to become like a child and believe that your father is able. Don't stop asking. Don't stop pursuing. Don't stop knocking. Don't stop seeking. You will never, ever frustrate God with faith. Amen? You can't frustrate God with faith. I might get frustrated with Levi because I'm imperfect. I'm a natural human being. And sometimes I just want to take a break and rest. But you can't frustrate God with your requests and your seeking and your knocking and your asking because you have faith in Him. Because that's the thing the Bible says pleases God. And that says to Him every time you come, every time you knock on that door, every time you come seeking, every time you come asking, it pleases God because He says, here's my child, and He has faith that I am able to do it. God can do it for you. He can do it this morning in your life. He is able. He is able. Nothing is too hard for Him. Nothing is impossible. If you would believe that He is able. Amen. You receive that this morning? Come on, let's stand to our feet. It's the end of this service. I want every head bowed, every eye closed, right there at home. Maybe watching online. Maybe listening on the radio. I want to pray with you this morning. And it's important because this journey of faith starts with Jesus. Is that that measure of faith is received the day that you receive Jesus. That measure of faith to do what God has called you to do and to live by faith in response to God is received the day you receive Jesus. And right now while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, just you and God there this morning, in your lounge, in your room, wherever you are this morning. I want to pray with you. 
Maybe you're saying, Pastor Mark, I don't know Jesus. I've never received Him. I've never asked Him into my life. And this morning, I want to do that. I want to receive Jesus. I want to be sure of salvation. I want the faith to live the life that God has called me to. Then I want to pray with you this morning. It's the greatest decision you can ever make. The day I made that decision, my entire life changed. I'm living a life that I never thought was possible to me because of all my sin and because of all I had done wrong and because of where I came from. I thought that this was a life beyond me. But when I received Jesus, I received faith to believe for a better life. And so Jesus comes and He turns your life around. And this morning you can receive a new life, a brand new start. A new beginning, new life. The Bible says God even gives you a new heart. He removes that heart of stone that's become hardened by life. He gives you a heart of flesh that responds to Him. Maybe this morning you've hardened your heart. You are saved, but you've realized you've backslidden and you've stopped believing and you don't think that God is able and maybe you're even angry or bitter at God. And this morning you realize that you need to come back. God's not changed. You say to yourself, I've changed. It's not too late to come back. If that's you this morning. I want to pray with you. Come back to God. He's a good Father that will receive you. No judgment, no condemnation. He just receives you as you are. Come on, if that's you this morning, let us know online. Send us a little message so we can reach out to you and connect with you. I'm going to pray with you this morning, and I want you to pray this prayer with me. And we're all going to pray, everybody in this building and you online, you listening on the radio. Pray this simple prayer, but it has a profound impact on your life. Repeat after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you rose from the dead to give me life. I believe that this morning I receive that life. Jesus, I thank you that all my sins are forgiven. I thank you that I'm washed in your blood, that I'm whiter than snow, and that I am a new creation. I thank you for a brand new start, for a brand new life. Lord Jesus, give me the faith to live this life that you have called me to. And I thank you that I know that you are able to do in my life what only you can. Here is my life. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give Jesus a shout of praise this morning. Come on, give yourself a hand.